with malaria, there are about a trillion little organisms swimming around. A trillion is, you know, something like a hundred times the number of humans on the whole earth. Inconceivable. <laughs> yeah. And, there, and there's something like a billion people in the world get malaria every year. So, right. so there is, you know, 10 to the 20th, 10 to the 21st uh, and astronomical numbers of these things. And mm -hmm. uh, we've challenged them in the past couple of decades with drugs, antibiotics, and they have been able to develop resistance to antibiotics. But, mm -hmm. but when you go and, and ask yourself, well, what did they do? Did they develop some new sophisticated molecular machinery like the other molecular machines that are in, are in the cell? Or, or, mm -hmm. And it turns out they make a few scratches, uh, so to speak, on, mm -hmm. on pre-existing machines. And, and that's uh, barely enough to, uh, to, uh, to survive the drugs. Uh, exactly. So they they come up with this, these minuscule uh, results. I, I think I say in the book that the, the Darwinian elephant labored mightily and, and <laughs> gave birth to a gnat. Uh, <laughs> right. And the important thing is that this is, this is observational data. It does not depend on somebody's imagination, uh, mm -hmm. like Professor Carroll's imagination or, or other Darwinian scientists who write their books. They can, you know, they might think that some some of these transitions would be easy, but mm -hmm. we have absolutely no experimental uh, or observational evidence to to conclude that. Yeah, and one one more more thing. Mm -hmm. My epiphany on this when I, I remember I was sitting on a bed in a bed and breakfast, looking out to sea and reading the chapter on proteins. That's <laughs> when I realized, goodness gracious something is really different from the way from a certain skeptical call it quote unquote bright a la richard dawkins way of looking at the world i thought really there is something going on talk about proteins and the way that they match or don't this is something really important for people to realize in terms of figuring out how random mutation could even create a cell. Proteins are pretty weird, aren't they? <laughs> well, they are weird in a, in a sense. They're all they're of course elegant too. Uh, uh, yeah. What the problem is? Most people, most lay people, think of the cell as kind of a squishy glob of jello or something. But <laughs> what modern science has showed that it it's actually filled with these. Uh, biological machines, uh, mm -hmm. which are composed mostly of things called proteins. And again, right. most people think of proteins as something you eat, but, but they're <laughs> not. <laughs> they're actually, uh, they're strings of chemicals called amino acids, which are put together. And uh, as an analogy, you can think of the amino acids as letters. And right. when you put letters together in the right way, they can spell out words and sentences and so on, but if you put them right. together in the wrong way, they don't spell anything. They, they convey no meaning. And, and the proteins make things happen by sticking to each other, by matching. That, and that, yeah, yeah, that's right. They're, they're, they're actually a lot more exotic than, than letters. They've uh, got chemical properties where they have regions that are positively charged or negatively charged, and those regions can attract each other, and another region which might be like uh, kind of an oily region, uh, but another one which is kind of like salt, which likes to be dissolved in water. And all of these things make a string of amino acids fold up on itself uh, in a particular way so that it assumes a shape like a machine. So suppose you had a, a piece of metal uh, on the floor and it had little magnets on it, the north side pointing up on some and the south side pointing up on others. And all of a sudden, it started to fold itself up, and it formed scissors. Uh, and now you can use this folded up metal as a piece of scissors. But when it was unfolded on the floor, you, you could not do that. Well, uh, right. yeah, proteins are like that. They form much more sophisticated machinery than scissors. They, they uh, can do very uh, exotic uh, chemical reactions. They can build things in your body. Uh, the retina in your eye is composed of a protein called rhodopsin, which interacts with light and helps send a signal onto your brain to start vision. And, and the blood, uh, blood contains a protein called hemoglobin, which binds to oxygen and delivers it to right. tissue. So proteins are, it's like going into Home Depot and finding all of these machines, all of these tools around, 
Uh, mm -hmm. Well, there are thousands and thousands of different proteins in your body, uh, right. and because of their particular shapes, they can do all these different jobs. And in any given cell, there are so very many proteins all jangling around in this blob, and they're somehow directed by DNA and RNA to create chemicals. They're just jangling around in this fluid, and they find one another, and the result is you and me doing this. Yes. And that's how evolution <laughs> has happened. Yeah. And yet, we're supposed to think that there's nothing miraculous about this, this process. Yeah, it seems and, pretty easy to me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's, it's fun to imagine it happening kind of step by step, but how this would go on. And so clearly, it's difficult to avoid a sense, and I think anybody, no matter how skeptical about you know high, higher beings is, would, it's difficult to avoid there being at least an illusion of teleology here, that there seems to be something directing this, that it can't be completely random. Yeah. Because, for example, a Sean Carroll cannot tell you how this, these jangling bags of proteins and endoplasmic reticulum, etc., came together to create a leg in the first place. It's one thing to be able to figure out how a leg is placed in one place as opposed to another. But how did something even start to have the particular detailed leg in question, and how does that leg go from the fly's leg to our leg, and things like that. And so, it seems that, and this is something that you seem to understandably pull back from getting too specific about in the book, but um, correct me if I'm wrong, it would seem to me that your idea is that random mutation alone cannot explain these things and that there must have been some sort of intelligent designer. And that intelligent designer, I presume, would be God, right? Well, I certainly think so. I, I'm a run-of-the-mill Christian, you know, uh, mm -hmm. But I, in the book, I try to act as, you know, I'm a scientist, and the scientific evidence uh, points to design. It doesn't, it doesn't, uh, there's no signature on, uh, on the molecular machinery saying who did it. And if somebody else wants to think that it was a space alien or something exotic, uh, <laughs> well, they're free to do it. The, the, the structure of the molecular machines doesn't uh, force, force you to believe one versus the other. But, but certainly I think, and most I think theists will think that it's uh, God is a major candidate for the role of, of designer. Well, I will definitely say that in reading your book, I came closer than I ever have at the age of 43 to believing in God. I, uh, quite frankly, do not and never have and think the world is a marvelous place anyway. And I never imagined that anybody could even begin to convince me that there was such a thing. Reading your book, I thought to myself, I can't think of what there would be that would create this kind of order out of chaos. And I suspect that many people, if they actually read the book all the way through, would have the same response. But the fact is, and I say this with full respect for your religious beliefs, I don't want to believe in God. I don't like change. And so <laughs> after I finished your book, I could not help thinking, wow, suppose he's wrong, because after all, I'm not a biochemist. I'm not a biologist. Is this really a solid case? And so one question I wanted to ask is, what makes you so sure that we're just not in an intermediate point, which I'm sure is the objection of various biologists of feces such as yours, and that we'll figure these sorts of things out? Why do you think that we've hit a wall? How, do you, how can you be so brave as to be so sure that you're not being premature? What is it that seems so completely irresolvable? Well, uh, you, you can never be completely sure in science. It, it's the nature of the... Uh, it's the nature of the discipline, and, and I will I never claim, and, and certainly don't now, that this is uh, that I have some sort of logical proof uh, mm -hmm. for for design and so on. But with science, you you got to go with the evidence where the evidence is pointing, and in my mind, it's clearly pointing strongly to design or something very similar to it. Now let mm -hmm. me give, let me give you an analogy to to kind of uh, show you my mindset uh, in the early. Uh, part of the 1900s, 1930 or so, most physicists thought that the universe was eternal and un mm -hmm. unchanging, uh, and that 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 uh, 
that satisfied them just fine. But then the uh, the um, motion of galaxies away from each other and away from the Earth was noticed, and that uh, that was the start of the Big Bang hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Big Bang hypothesis at the time struck a lot of people, and still strikes a lot of people, including a lot of scientists, as having theological implications. You know, who mm -hmm. knows? Maybe this was you know the creation or, or some such thing. Uh, and a lot of scientists at the time didn't like this idea one bit. Okay. Uh, so why didn't they just say, well, you know, we don't like this idea. Uh, we can't. There might be some other explanation for it. So we'll just pass over this Big Bang hypothesis. We'll continue mm -hmm. continue to think that the universe is eternal, and maybe some new idea will come along in 50 years, and we'll latch onto that. Well, if they, if they had done that, they would be...